It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Miller Converse Roundtable. Note that we are providing live captioning of this event, and you can view these captions by turning on the closed captioning feature on your screen. We will monitor the chat throughout today's event. Please post a message there if you have a question or need assistance. Following the presentations by the speakers, we'll, we will take time for your questions. We ask that you submit questions for the panel at any time using the Q&A feature in Zoom. A recording of this event, of event will be available on the CPS website in the coming days. So our center CPS is one of five centers in ISR. And every year we celebrate two founders of ISR and CPS, Warren Miller and Phil Converse. Our Miller Converse event this year is a three person faculty panel on the topic of the future of democracy. This is a big question, of course, and the three of us on the panel will discuss findings and results specific to our own research agendas. The event honors Converse and Miller, two giants in the study of voting, public opinion, elections, political parties, and yes, democracy and democratic processes. They were part of the generation of social scientists who founded ISR, as I mentioned, and Miller was the founding director of CPS. Their names are synonymous with the establishment of behavioral research in political science and political psychology, and with creating ongoing survey research studies to analyze population dynamics and public opinion as it changes over time and as it reflects diverse attitudes, knowledge, and participation levels across population groups. They helped establish, for instance, the American National Election Studies as the premier survey about politics. And they were both institution builders with Miller establishing ICPSR and CPS and both helping to build ISR into the kind of interdisciplinary and innovative institution that it is today. Their research spanned many topics and settings. They were both instrumental in the groundbreaking work on partisanship, a topic that I will discuss in more detail shortly. For the moment, I wanna focus on democracy and democratic processes and especially to focus in on Converse's famous 1964 paper on mass attitudes. Both Miller and Converse were fundamentally interested in the connections between mass public attitudes and preferences and the workings of governments. It is reflected in all of their writings. Converse's paper is well known for setting agendas and defining concepts and methods for many later generations. The latter part of that paper, however, contains Converse's worries about democracy. Much of the paper shows in painstaking detail the shortcomings of ordinary people's knowledge and attention to politics. Most people, Converse showed, have little knowledge and pay little attention to politics. A small portion of the public pays attention and their attitudes reflect elite level conceptualizations of the political landscape. Converse in his paper at the end refers back to Nazi Germany and to the Jim Crow American South and other authoritarian regimes to express his deep worry that a relatively uninformed public was manipulable and could be swayed by demagoguery and misled about their own interests and could have their induced preferences moved by self-interested elites and all to the danger of the survival of democratic systems. So this question today, can democracy survive, is a hot topic right now for reasons that you all know. Democracy has lost ground around the world, but also perhaps in our own country. And it's not a new topic. And the two men we honor with this event today worried about this very question. Their ambition was to study as scientists survey responses survey respondents and political parties and candidates, much like other scientists studied cells and cancer and atoms and planets. For a moment, they were disinterested just to target the right answer empirically, but they had normative motivations. They believed in the promise of democracy, that government could be responsive to the mass public through mechanisms of free and fair elections and the free flow of information. Before discussing my own research, uh, let me remark on the absence of Ron Englehart, who was originally scheduled to be part of this panel. Ron had to step aside because he has lost his voice temporarily due to a surgery. 
He regrets missing his speaking engagement here. Let me take this opportunity, however, to mention his new book. And I'll put a slide. Ron writes books like We Spawn Daffodils in Our Spring Gardens about once a year these days. And this is his third book in about as many years, all on extremely important topical subjects. OK, so here is a plug for Ron's new book. Uh, that's come, Well, it seems like it's already come out in January of 2021 from Oxford University Press about religion's sudden decline, what's causing it and what comes next. And he links that question to questions of democracy and democratic retreat and or advancement. OK, so thank you, everybody. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. And Rob uh, Francis and Pauline Jones will also talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I'm actually going to time myself because I'm playing dual roles here as the uh, moderator and also uh, as a speaker. So I want to talk about moderation and extremism in American political parties. And it's not directly tied initially to the question of the panel, but I will link this to um, to this question at the end of my talk uh, because it's, uh, I think, quite relevant. So the, um, the main points I want to get across uh, about um, the research that I've done with John Jackson um, is we have a framework in a book that we've published recently uh, that relates the changes that political parties undergo, their issue position changes and their ideological changes in search of election victories, and perhaps because of factional fights among their leaders, and the partisanship of the electorate and different groups in the electorate. And it's a book that um, I'll show you the, the uh, cover of it shortly. It's a book that um, uh, studies four countries, uh, the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia. I'm going to focus my remarks today on the United States. But the framework here is parties are changing and adopting new issue positions, ideologies. The mass public pays attention to these movements. And then both partisanship and voting decisions respond to evaluations, we call them utilities, but evaluations by ordinary people of these parties' positions relative to their own interests. So that's kind of in the abstract and general form, the overall framework that we adopt uh, in this research. And you might say, well, that seems um, so straightforward. Well, it's... Um, a little distinct from how other people have thought about partisanship, including uh, the two men we honor with this, this lecture today. Now, as far as specific points, current events kind of points, the, this moment, um, I want to make the case uh, that both major parties are perceived to have moved away from the center since 2008. Uh, it, it, it preceded Donald Trump. Um, that there has been an issue-based realignment of sorts that, if, uh, that have um, altered the, uh, the kinds of issues the, policy, the parties have adopted. This has had an effect on partisanship. It's had an effect, of course, on election outcomes. The backdrop to this are patterns that are probably well familiar to many of you on this call, which is the um, shift of the working class towards right-wing parties and towards the right, and shifts of the educated, the more educated, to the left and towards left-wing parties. Um, and that these shifts are true in many countries, including all four of the countries that we study in our book, and that these have enormous consequences for um, politics uh, on many dimensions, but also for the, um, our current moment where we are concerned about the survival of democratic processes. Uh, I also wanna make the case that party, uh, well, or, or just assert that Republicans have lost total partisans in, um, in recent years. Uh, Democrats have gained total partisans, but it's really only a little in each case. And so uh, it's an interesting discussion um, that we can have about whether um, either party has missed an opportunity to gain partisans uh, 
uh, in response to the other parties moving out away from the center or more moderate positions. So this is a graphic uh, of the placement, the average placement of uh, American National Election Survey respondents to the parties and the presidential candidates for the major parties uh, over time and where they place them on a seven point scale uh, with more liberal being down in lower numbers and more conservative being um, higher numbers. And you see the middle line is where self-placement is. Uh, you can argue and many people have that these kinds of ideological placements don't have a lot of content or meaning. Um, that's a, interesting and, and I, I think there's, we, we, we believe there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but they do seem to correlate with other more issue-based um, uh, evaluations that people have of where the parties are on the issues. So if you look at the uh, sort of uh, top lines, um, you'll see that um, the Republican Party has uh, been perceived to shift to the right really since 2008. Uh, that's the gray line at the top. Um, and interestingly, Donald Trump was, um, was not seen as so far to the right in 2016, but he is perceived to be quite far to the right uh, in 2020 and tracks the party um, uh, pretty, pretty closely. And so there's a sh big shift in people's perceptions of Donald Trump um, in, in at least to the NES, ANES respondents. These are uh, way, uh, weighted, weighted analysis from the most recent release of the ANES. Now, caveat, we do, we do recognize that um, there are different sampling effects over time, but we would not see these kinds of shifts even given the sampling changes and the mode changes that occurred in 2020. And if you look at the bottom figure, interestingly enough, um, the top line, the, the more yellowish line, shows that people perceived Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton roughly the same ideologically, but they did pick up a perceived move to the left by the Democratic Party. So they separate there down from 16 to 20 uh, in, in, in terms of per, you know, people's perceptions of where the parties are. So this is our book. It's a shameless plug for a book that's coming out pretty soon from the University of Chicago Press. Uh, the book is, um, again, it involves a study of four countries and their part, the, the partisanship of major groups in the population over uh, decades going back into the uh, 1950s, um, at least 50s for the US and the 60s for the other parties or the other countries, sorry. Um, we. I can say several things about the book, but um, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, we look at both micro data, that is individual level survey data, and also macro data. And the nice thing is our, uh, our models of partisanship um, uh, kind of connect together, both micro and macro. We're very, uh, we think that is an advance on previous literature in this for sure. Um, but to, to give you a sense of where we think we've made some progress, is um, we are able through a modeling framework to compare different explanations for why people's partisanship changes. And so um, the most common reason we found across the four countries uh, that people change their partisanship is the perception that the major parties are moving away from them or toward them on issues of fundamental importance. And in the US, those issues have been um, left, right uh, economics issues, the role of the government in the economy and also racial liberalism. Uh, uh, racial issues are critical for understanding um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dynamics of partisanship among major groups, and I'll show something about that shortly. Um, they change much less commonly because of a perception that the performance of an incumbent party in office has been wanting or lacking, and because the, we detect changes in the issue preferences of population groups or individuals. Um, that's not to say that never matters in partisanship dynamics. That is, uh, sometimes we do detect some elements of par uh, per preference change. Um, for example, on things like gay rights and some, some race racial issues. And also uh, in certain countries like the UK, we have detected that uh, 
the working class has become a bit more comfortable with capitalism than they were several decades ago. But those are the exceptions. In general, it's the parties are moving in elite space. People tend to have preferences that stay relatively fixed and they change their partisanship in reaction. So the American voter, uh, obviously Miller and Converse were two of the authors of this very famous book, um, talked about partisanship as a result of socialization and that partisanship shapes the perceptions of events of candidates and shapes the vote. Now, we don't wanna argue necessarily with this. Um, this makes a lot of sense and is sort of robust to, and is very good at predicting the vote. The idea of socialization determines partisanship generally for most people. Uh, how they grow up, their parents, et cetera. Um, and events, what happens with candidates then is, is reflected through partisanship to, to, to determine their vote choice. In our book, it's a little different because we're focused in on dynamics. We're interested in how partisanship changes. You know, group memberships based on interests, uh, based on uh, perhaps elements of socialization determines partisanship. Uh, party utilities, which is your evaluation of where the parties are relative to you, shape partisanship and the vote, jointly determined. And it's malleable. And we model it as, as a form of uh, what's, what's called Bayesian updating, which is a, a sort of a, a, a way to model how people incorporate new information in their decisions. So this is kind of the more uh, framework that we adopt in our book. Um, party utilities affect both partisanship and the vote choice. And there's Bayesian updating based on the party's behaviors. Okay. The one thing um, we like about our approach, and I think one of our major motivations, is to be able to explain change. And um, this is a this is a graph that shows some really famous changes in American politics over the last. Um, you know, 70 years. And the top line, this top dotted line is of uh, uh, African Americans uh, in both the North and South. We pooled them for this graphic, although we analyzed the Southern and Northern Blacks separately. But there was a big jump towards the Democrats in the 60s, and they've roughly stayed there. They bounce around based on candidates, based on uh, certain things. Um, you know, they liked Nixon for a while. Uh, they were, um, uh, you know, uh, bouncing around, but in general, uh, they've uh, stayed very comfortably in the Democratic partisanship column. Northern whites are roughly evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. That's this other dotted line. It's hugs the zero line. That's an enormously diverse group. Um, we won't say a lot about Northern whites, but this dark line is a very famous trend that people have studied over and over. And it's the Southern white change from being uh, democratic towards more Republican. And it's a gradual change. It starts in the fifties and it, it, it's not, this is, it's important. This is a, obviously a combination of, of um, some cohort replacement but it is largely driven by uh, people themselves changing their partisanship. And we have evidence for that in the book, uh, becoming more uh, becoming more Republican over time. And so our framework can address these different dynamic patterns, abrupt shifts and stasis um, and gradual declines. Now, I do wanna show you some data from um, Britain just briefly. Uh, the, um, this is a pattern that shows itself in many countries. And this is the working class, uh, self-identified working class declining in their support for the leftist party. This is the Labour Party in Britain, um, pretty much from the 60s to the 90s. Um, this is a big change. It doesn't look like a big change, but it is a big change. And then, of course, even a more remarkable change is people who considered themselves middle class moving from not supporting the leftist parties to becoming much more supportive of the leftist parties. Um, now, these other dotted lines are the, the Thatcher period and the Blair period. I don't want to get into that. Uh, recent times have been interesting in that the middle class is shifting back to the right. This partly reflects what's happening within Britain and inside the Labour Party, um, shifting to the left, actually, which is an interesting moment that um, is worth discussing, but I won't dwell on it here. This last slide is the one that I really want to um, kind of mostly finish on. I'll, I'll, I'll have a concluding slide after this. Um, 
John and I, at the last chapter of the book, um, and we've done some other work since for a, 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 an editorial in the Washington Post, and we're continuing to analyze this kind of um, material. We use the patterns from the past to um, uh, predict what's going to happen in the what would happen in the future if the two parties take different positions. And um, these positions are on, again, the racial liberalism and on um, the left-right scale. Uh, there's also some, some evidence of positions on gay rights in some of these data. But essentially, to, to kind of put it all together, these are this chart shows what would happen with different population groups as the Democratic Party would move to the left. And the status quo is if we assumed that the party, the Democratic Party was perceived to be the same as it was in 2016, and then uh, progressive, aggressive progressive and centrist, um, if they've actually moved a little bit more to the center than they were than the Hillary Clinton's Democratic Party. And what you see is the decline in Democratic partisanship for every population group. Um, uh, African-Americans are a little more complex in that they seem to like the status quo of 2016, but their partisanship actually drops away um, as if the Democratic Party moves to the left or moves to the right. Whereas for whites, um, the Democratic Party would gain if, the if it moved to the left. These lines in each of the columns refer to what the Republicans would do, because this is relative to what the Republicans would do. And what of course you see is that um, partisanship becomes more democratic for every single group as the Republicans uh, become more extreme. So where does this leave us for our question? And I'll finish with this. Um, the trends of both parties away from the center is really worrisome for many people. Um, if you think of extreme party positions as including the, the actions of leaders to pursue extra legal or contested legal strategies to either pass policies or hold and maintain power. Um, I think that um, that's at least arguable that um, the more extreme parties are, the more they are um, open to these kinds of strategies. Uh, the shift of the working class towards rightist parties is worrisome. I, I say this in a completely nonpartisan, is attempting to be as completely nonpartisan. I think the consequences of this are hard to predict, but there, this is worrisome because um, of, I think this is an empirical claim, they're, um, they're less, uh, uh, less, or I guess more openness to extra legal or um, uh, contested legal strategies for adopting policies. The shift of the educated towards the leftist parties uh, is less worrisome, partly I think because they're shifting towards a more technocratic leftism and not towards a robust kind of um, union, or I should say socialist or communist based leftism. So it's not symmetric. And I think that is an important thing uh, to us to kind of digest, uh, at least not right now. Um, but these changes in relationships between elites and mass in terms of uh, partisanship and policies and ideas, um, I think are, are, um, are worrisome in, in many ways. So I'll stop there. Okay. So uh, the next person is Rob Francis, uh, who's uh, one of my dear old friends in the department, uh, a research professor in the Center for Political Studies, professor and associate chair of the Department of Political Science and director of the program in International Comparative Studies at the university. Uh, Francis's research interests center on the comparative and international political economy of developed democracies and related aspects of empirical methodology. His work has focused on how political and economic institutions, structure, and circumstances affect macroeconomic policymaking, its character, and its efficacy. He's currently conducting research, which he will talk about, on the diverse responses of people either toward or away from political extremism. So, Rob. 
All right, thank you. And I'm glad to be here uh, to honor uh, Warren and Phil um, and share some thoughts with you all. I'm gonna sh start the sharing of those thoughts with the sharing of my screen, uh, which hopefully just occurred. Uh, and going full screen and moving my Zoom window with Ken and Pauline's picture so that I can see what I'm talking about. Um, right, so uh, I'm gonna be talking about this, uh, this question that's here in black. Uh, so not directly about whether uh, democracy, uh, the prospects for democratic survival, uh, but uh, I, what we've been exploring is what explains the rise of far right uh, nationalist xenophobic extremism and right wing populism uh, in uh, across the developed democracies, really, and, and we'll use the U.S. Uh, as a as the focal case here. Um, so uh, this is joint work with a set of uh, U of M connected uh, uh, scholars, uh, Diogo Ferrari, who's now at University of California Riverside, Patrick Wu, who's uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, and uh, Hayden, as our uh, Hayden Jackson, Byungkoo Kim, and Wusyo Kim. So. Um, so we want to explain this rise of far right nationalism, nationalism uh, and uh, right wing populism. So I'll start by just sort of uh, demonstrating that there has in fact been such a rise. Um, so here on the left uh, from The Economist, uh, we can simply look at January 2013 and May 2016 elections uh, and the vote intentions of the respondents in these countries uh, for far right parties as uh, I, I won't go into the list of which parties those are, uh, but you can see there that there's, a, there's been a rise in almost every single uh, Western European uh, democracy um, uh, in the support for far right parties. Uh, some cases dramatic rises, other cases less so. Uh, some cases, uh, you know, at, at from and to higher levels, in some cases less so. Um, uh, but there's definitely been a rise in support for far right parties across the developed world and uh, farther right candidates with it, uh, within uh, the US primary system. Um, and, and at the same time, there's been a rise in, uh, in extremism, uh, including violent extremism uh, of the far right, both in the Western Europe and the United States. And so there's one chart here of uh, terrorist incidents and you can see the rise actually begins uh, uh, the current rise, and we won't look at these uh, uh, pre-2008 or so uh, dynamics, uh, but the current rise in the U.S. is in red there, uh, is dramatic through 2016, uh, and then I have to move my Ken and Pauline window, um, and then in the rise of uh, American extremism uh, uh, graphic from the Southern Poverty Law Center, again, you can see this starting around 2008, a rapid rise in patriot groups in particular, a more steady and slower and prolonged rise in hate groups uh, in green. Uh, and of course, um, uh, everybody uh, remembers this photo from the, uh, or remembers the events of the Unite the Right rally and this photo of Confederate flags and Nazi flags uh, in, in the march uh, in the United States. Um, the number of part, like this one figure here from Youngblood in 2020 is one that I'll return to a bit later just to uh, ground the case here. This is the rising number of uh, extremist exposures where uh, uh, exposures means either through the act being committed, the violent act uh, uh, acts or that um, uh, they were caught out by the authorities. So there's definitely been some rise in this far right nationalist xenophobic extremism and uh, accompanying that a rise in uh, right wing populist uh, candidates and their support. Um, and scholars, of course, have been extremely interested in this. Uh, and uh, so we wanted, noting all these uh, rising uh, anti everything sentiments and that they were uh, went along with um, a, a, a sea shift of white working class voters. Uh, and a near completion of the uh, rural urban divide and later and nowadays the rural exurban versus urban suburban divide. Um, scholars looked for explanation of this and uh, one natural place that they landed uh, was this notion that people had been socioeconomically left behind and were experiencing angst at that. Um, and uh, that could come either as a natural result of comparative advantage and globalization, uh, or as a matter of fact, automation has much the same implications, automation and globalization are being uh, uh, complementary, not contradictory 
uh, sources of this potential socioeconomic gains. And then as scholars turn to look at voting outcomes and support for um, uh, the leave option in Brexit and support for Marine Le Pen and other uh, far right candidates across Europe and in the United States uh, support for Donald Trump in 2016, um, one noticed that the, at, at the regional comparative level, vote support uh, for these uh, uh, farther right options uh, was rising everywhere there was, uh, in fact, some regional geographic, uh, geographically concentrated uh, uh, economic hard times. So in other words, these uh, political economy explanations appear in the, uh, in the voting behavior uh, district by district or region by region to be very strongly supported. Uh, but then when scholars uh, took up the individual level survey data and began to ask this question, well, is this a, a reaction to socioeconomic malaise and decline? Or they would praise it as, or is this a, some kind of sociocultural status threat that the world is moving in some new radical ways that I find uh, very uncomfortable and that's likely uh, tinged with xenophobia and, and racism. Uh, when these studies looked at those, um, uh, at, at these alternative, as these possible explanations, socioeconomic or sociocultural, as alternatives, uh, to make the story short, uh, the the data, the answer from the data at the micro level, people's own behaviors and own opinions, is that if you uh, if you put them in a horse race, ec personal economic conditions. Uh, versus these uh, perceived uh, positions on immigration in China and one's social dominance orientation, that's what SDO stands for. Across every study in every context in every country, this individual level data seems to tell you it's all about this xenophobic threat perception and it uh, doesn't have anything to do with the economic conditions. Um, our view is that uh, that's that that conclusion that it's all sociocultural and it's not socioeconomic is uh, well to put it bluntly it's it's both wrong and wrongheaded uh, that it's not helpful uh, and it also it's not correct uh, that uh, even notwithstanding the statistical results the issue is that you've controlled for people's perceptions of economic conditions and of policies and you've controlled for people's uh, socio uh, sociological uh, angst, uh, and then uh, and then you've asked, controlling for that, what are the effects of these economic conditions the individuals are experiencing? Uh, and if you stop for a moment and think about that, what you're, uh, what would you expect the reaction of an individual experiencing economic hardship, but not developing thereby a preference for candidates who are uh, engaged in demagogic otherizing appeals? How would you expect them to react? Well, they would not react towards these candidates. It's only the candidates who experiencing the socioeconomic and cultural anxiety form these threatened perceptions. It's only those who would then be supporting those extreme uh, rights. And so that's the way uh, to put it or put it much more simply. Uh, we're saying it's not either or, it's both and, right? Uh, that both neighborhood socioeconomic malaise and decline and xenophobic anxiety at sociocultural change and status threat, they're both part of a broader sense of, of socioeconomic and cultural threat that we're, fe we're feeling that people, uh, us and people like us and our whole way of life is under threat uh, in this new and globalizing world. And, uh, and then another important feature of our, uh, of our approach is that uh, this is gonna render some uh, folks feeling uh, or experiencing these socioeconomic and cultural changes. Uh, some folks more susceptible to the other, otherizing demagogic railing against the socialist corrupt elite, the media and the foreigners, it's gonna make some more receptive to that, but not others. So graphically, because academics like these kind of flow charts, uh, one way you could see that what our argument is, is that neighborhood socioeconomic uh, malaise and decline is part of what uh, creates this perception uh, of some voters, not others, uh, that, uh, that us and people like us are under attack and being looked down upon uh, from those elites at, uh, elites at the corner and, uh, and our neighborhoods uh, are, are deteriorating. And some of those folks, uh, not others, uh, will, be, uh, will become more susceptible to or more uh, open to uh, support for uh, extremist uh, demagogic appeals. Sometimes there will be a triggering event uh, that, that will show you, will 
uh, spur in some people uh, a uh, engagement with extremist groups and uh, and and by extension perhaps uh, uh, far right candidates. Um, but it's important to us also that there's there's heterogeneity in these relationships. Some people are going to be susceptible. Some are immune, and some may even become more repulsed uh, by such appeals, uh, uh, given a, a socioeconomic hardship in their condition. So uh, I wanted to keep track of my time. I'm doing okay, I guess. So the standard approach would be like here down in number one. Uh, you put it in a horse race, there's some economic hardship that folks are, uh, are experiencing, uh, but they also have some perception that, uh, uh, that their way of life is being denigrated and uh, being left uh, aside and put down uh, by those elites at the center. Um, and when you put them in a horse race, what you find is no relationship from the economic hardship to, in this case, it's, uh, the data was looking at uh, support for, uh, for Donald Trump and the survey respondents. Um, and, uh, and you see a strong relationship between this perception uh, that our way of life is under attack by those foreigners and uh, media elites. Um, but part two, if you put this into a flowchart sort of relationship and ask, is it possible that the economic, con socioeconomic conditions uh, the individual is experiencing and perceives are partly contributing to those sociocultural threat perceptions that produce uh, the response? What you see is that uh, this is a coefficient, um, which is positive and greater than zero. You do in fact see uh, evidence of that path. Whereas when you uh, uh, look at the relationship of economic hardship, not through this path of perceived socioeconomic cultural response, you find no relationship. So this is uh, part one of our response uh, to why are you not seeing a relationship of economic hardship is that, they, that it's not economic hardship per se, but it's economic hardship in those uh, who, uh, uh, that that hardship creates a percept, uh, contributes to their, their sense that their sociocultural group are being left behind. Uh, then part, uh, uh, part two of our story, and so three of my char chart here, is that there's heterogeneity in their responses. And so that uh, Diogo Ferrari, one of the co-authors here has developed a tool which enables us simultaneously to estimate, uh, to try to summarize briefly, to estimate which respondents are in which groups. We don't know what groups there are yet, but we can estimate uh, which respondents are in which kinds of groups in terms of how they respond uh, to these economic conditions, uh, allowing there to be some heterogeneity uh, for the data to discover. And what you, what you find when you do that is you find that there are actually uh, four different groups characterized differently by how they respond differently to um, different variables, different uh, events, uh, elements in their environment. And then there's one group it's really, it's the largest group at 31% of the sample that responds very strongly along this path chart that we've talked about, right? And so when you, when you do that in, uh, in our heterogeneous mediated relationship, so first there's the mediated relationship and it shows you that economic hardship relates significantly to the perception of sociocultural threat in these respondents. And then it's that perceived sociocultural threat that produces support for Trump, not directly an economic relationship to it, uh, to tr support for Trump. That's the minus 0.008 um, controlling for sociocultural threat. So that's your sort of homogenous relationship. When you look just at this one cluster that is in this responsive group, some are susceptible, some are immune, and some are uh, possibly repulsed. When you look at just that uh, sensitive group, Right then, both the path from economic hardship to their perceiving that this is part of a whole complex of ways in which uh, myself and people like me are being left behind, looked down upon, experiencing hardship, uh, and that produces uh, the perception of socio-cultural economic threat, which is the thing that very strongly, indeed more strongly even uh, than in the general uh, in the horse race analyses. Uh, relates to uh, support for these farther right candidates. We've also found similar heterogeneity in other contexts, but I'm nearly out of time. So I'm just gonna make that claim and move on <laughs> that there's similar heterogeneity in other uh, claims. So let me return to uh, now uh, away from voting into extremist activity. 
Um, this chart, as I mentioned earlier, is the number of uh, exposed cases of ex uh, far right extremist acti violent activities. Exposed means either they were caught uh, and, and prosecuted uh, or they uh, carried out the attack. And what you'll see is what we know is that there was this large uptick in 2016 and 17, but that that's part of a, a broader trend that had been going on, rising right wing uh, extremist, uh, including right wing violent extremist action. Uh, this is its geographic distribution across the country uh, in a pluripleth map. And these are a regression that tries to look at, uh, well, it's not a regression, a very, very fancy regression uh, that tries to look at the relationship between some of these variables. This is not our work. This is Mason Youngblood in 2020, um, it, looking at these sets of variables and how they might relate to these uh, violent out the count of these violent outcomes. Don't worry too much about these coefficients. Just let me tell you this one important thing. Uh, a coefficient of one means that there's no relationship. Bigger than one means there's a positive relationship between this variable and, uh, and, uh, and right-wing extremist acts occurring, and less than one means there's a negative relationship. Those things uh, reduce it. Don't pay too much attention to the specific coefficients because there's some crucial things that are not in this model that need to be. Um, but uh, what this data will tell you in, in our short minutes that I'm already one minute into injury time on, uh, you'll have to take my word for it. What these numbers are showing us is that what Ken was talking about, that indicators of urban, educated, and, uh, and non-white residents uh, are all things that are reducing the incidence of, uh, of far-right extremist activity. Uh, whereas poverty and hate group connection, particularly since you controlled for uh, urban and non-white, uh, non-urban and white uh, uh, poverty. Uh, is associated with those attacks. And the second part of this table is about there being strong contagion and connection through social networks, uh, which is uh, what, oops, I don't wanna go to, I want just one slide, please. Thank you. Um, sorry, looking at my time here, I'm about two minutes uh, past 15. Um, so let me look at this uh, chart, which many people find very interesting and exciting. This is uh, primarily due to the work of Patrick Wu, one of the co-authors we've talked about uh, before. What he has is he has uh, Twitter data, tweets, uh, that are uh, from uh, a, an anonymized uh, large sample of, of Twitter users in geographic locations, namely Lordstown, in and around Lordstown, Ohio, in and around Flat Rock, Warren, and Hamtramck, Michigan. And what's interesting to us about these places is that they were involved in this famous uh, announcement and then subsequent closure of the Lordstown, Ohio factory that Donald Trump talked about a lot in 2016 and then it, and promised that they would bring it back. And then, of course, it closed, in fact, uh, as, as originally promised. And what we have is we have the share of the tweets, of all tweets, that are uh, interacting with, that means they mention, quote, retweet or link to tweets, uh, with alt-right and hate groups, as identified by, for instance, the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC. And so uh, in the time from 2018 January to 2019 December is the time period we have, we see that on average there was about 0 0.003, that's the share of all tweets that are connecting to uh, alt-right and hate groups. And then there's the announcement in, uh, in late November 2018 of the closure, and then the actual closure in uh, June 3rd of uh, 2019. And what you see is that the engagement with these far right extremist and white nationalist in many cases groups uh, more than doubles. So the share of tweets that are reaching out to or finding openness with uh, uh, these extremist and right groups are being triggered uh, by economic collapse in the location. You see something similar but smaller scale in Flat Rock and you see nothing in Warren uh, and Hamtramck uh, Flat Rock, uh, there wasn't an announced uh, or a closure. In Warren and Hamtramck, there was. So this, to us, speaks to the heterogeneity that we're talking about. And what heterogeneity is there? Well, first of all, there's heterogeneity in the magnitude of the closure. Lordstown is huge, uh, and especially relative to the size of Lordstown itself, whereas Warren and Hamtramck are small, uh, and uh, relative to the size of, the, uh, of their economic size and population size of their towns. and uh, and secondly, uh, and I think even more importantly, is the heterogeneity. This is rural and exurban Lordstown and Flat Rock, and uh, over uh, almost entirely white. 
and Warren is very diverse and urban, and Hantramic is majority minority and urban. Uh, and uh, so then it becomes less surprising that in fact you see a downward tick in engagement with extremists and far right, uh, in particular white nationalist uh, groups in Hamtramck. Why would you see a downward trick? Why would closing the plant make uh, those auto workers and others in that area less likely to engage with the right? Well, they're African Americans, so it seems unlikely to me that the closure of the plant is going to make them sort of uh, suddenly decide the plant uh, sounds like a good option. Uh, so. Uh, I'll try to return in my uh, 30 seconds uh, that I've left myself uh, here to the, uh, the question. So extremism and especially far right extremism is a currently rising and often violent threat to democracy and democratic society in the US and the rest of the developed world. So our, uh, our entrance to uh, today's conversation is that we would, we would uh, uh, suggest therefore that understanding the provenance of this rising far right extremism better, understanding the, uh, the provenance of the support for, uh, uh, for right-wing populists tapping into that, uh, that strand uh, is urgently essential. Um, we think it's wrong, uh, uh, but, also, uh, but uh, whether it's wrong or not, it's unhelpful to think of sociocultural threat and socioeconomic threat as alternatives that are actually complementary and part of the same causal chain. We want to emphasize neighborhood socioeconomic malaise even more so than individual. Uh, and we want to em emphasize the uh, heterogeneity in response. And especially on that last point, and I'll conclude there, our next step in the work it has to be to, uh, to explore these propositions about what underlines that heterogeneity. Why are some folks uh, in, in response to economic hardship and uh, social cultural change uh, becoming more receptive? Why are some uh, immune uh, and why do some react uh, uh, if they do negatively? Uh, we think that's crucially important. Okay, thanks, Rob. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Pauline Jones. Um, she's a faculty associate in the Center for Political Studies, a professor of political science and director of the Digital Islamic Studies curriculum. Previously, she served as director of U of M's Islamic Studies program and the International Institute. Uh, she's in, currently engaged in two major research projects, exploring the influence of religion on political attitudes and behavior in Muslim majority states and another project focusing on identifying the factors that affect the extent to which people are complying with social distancing policies to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact that these policies are having on individuals and communities around the world. So Pauline, you're on. Great, thanks Karen. So I am going to uh, shift our discussion to uh, focus on democratic survival in the Muslim world a part of the world where um, most of us probably think that democracy is either unlikely or impossible due to a familiar uh, trope that Islam and democracy are somehow incompatible. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to briefly acknowledge uh, my co-author, uh, Hanasa Binti Abdullah-Sani, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the National University of Singapore and has been a visiting associate at the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies here at the University of Michigan. Uh, this presentation is based on a recent edition that she and I guest edited, uh, the Democracy and Autocracy newsletter, which is published again here at the University of Michigan by the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracy. Uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Dan Slater and Rob Mickey are the usual editors. They invited us to, to guest edit um, uh, on democratic survival in the Muslim world. And we use that sort of to inspire us to really think through uh, what it means um, and how we can overcome sort of this, this trope that Islam and democracy are somehow incompatible. Um, so what can we learn by studying de democratic survival in the Muslim world, particularly since it's this place where, you know, we've been led to think that it's unlikely, if not impossible. Well, I think there are two key lessons and two key things I'd like everyone to walk away with uh, today. And the first is that democracy and Islam are not incompatible at all. Um, there are lots of empirical evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, there, first of all, Muslim democracies uh, exist uh, all around the world, um, and it's not just that you know Muslim majority countries have transitioned, particularly since the latter half of the past century, uh, to democracy, but also that they're 
there are democracies, Muslim majority countries that are democracies in multiple regions, regions that are very diverse across the world. Middle East and North Africa, Southeast Asia, the Balkans, Central Asia, and West Africa. So there's plenty of empirical evidence uh, to suggest uh, that these claims uh, that Muslim political culture or Islamic doctrine or Islamic institutions somehow prevent democracy from taking root in the Muslim world. Um, there's also uh, the empirical evidence that's suggested by a lot of the survey research, some of which has been done again by, by my colleagues uh, and, and our, our colleagues in the Center for Political Studies, Mark Tesler in particular, that show that um, there's broad popular support for democracy uh, among Muslims, again, across regions, across the world, around the world. Um, Muslims are, it show, this survey research over the past two decades has, has shown, are mostly supportive of democracy as a form of government. And they do not view democracy as incompatible with their religious principles or institutions. Um, we've also witnessed, again, another, more empirical evidence, we've also witnessed a popular demand for democracy at, I might add, enormous personal costs in many cases, um, in the stunning wave of pro-democracy protests and uprising across the Middle East and North Africa, known as the Arab Spring. The second key lesson that I want uh, to hopefully convince you of today um, is that democracy itself, and one of the things we can learn by studying these, these Muslim majority countries that have transitioned to democracy, um, democracy itself is in a constant state of struggle to, to survive. Democracy everywhere. Um, there, there's no such thing really as a threshold for democracy, as far as I can tell. Um, it's not as if you can cross some certain threshold and then you're democracy forever and you never have to worry um, about, about uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, attacks uh, or threats. Um, democracies might thrive, but they're never triumph. They're never really the only game in town. I think that's a myth. Um, and it's not a question of mortality. So democracies don't just die, um, to, to quote a famous book cover. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a test of vitality. There, there's varieties of vitality in terms of how democracies uh, meet this challenge of a constant state of struggle to survive. So what we're dealing with is not an outcome per se, but a process, a process toward, I think, building resilience. And I think that's an important lesson for us as Americans, frankly, um, in the present context in which we live. So what, it, what does this mean concretely to think about democracy as in a constant state of struggle to survive? What are the dimensions of democratic survival? Um, we think that there are two key dimensions that we need to think about in um, typologizing, if you will, these varieties of democratic um, vitality. The first is duration. So it's the length of time that a country maintains a certain level of democracy since its initial transition to democracy. This is very much for us a contextual measure. Um, importantly, it's based on comparing the country's level of democracy to the, the regional average, the, the region in which it resides. Uh, and it's a temporal uh, measure in the sense that they're, uh, they're compared to the world average at any given time. Uh, so both geographically and temporally, uh, we, we take into consideration the context of that particular uh, democratic state, democratic country. Um, it's it's uh, built on um, the insight from the consolidation, the democratic consolidation literature that um, you need two elections to sort of be considered uh, to have consolidated uh, post-transition to democracy. Um, to uh, peaceful transitions of, of power, to elections with a peaceful transition of power. Um, but we focus more on endurance. So it's not so much that you consolidate, and again, you've met a threshold and you can move on, but rather that it gives you some sense of that the institutions you've built uh, during this period, particularly the electoral institutions, have um, shown that they can endure. Uh, you can have this dimension consists of, of uh, two uh, aspects. There's uh, short duration, there's long duration. Uh, duration is considered short for a country if the level of democracy is either below the regional and the world average, so both the regional and world average, or it's above um, the regional and world average for less than a decade. And it's considered long if the level of democracy is above the regional average and the world average for at least a dec decade. Um, so it has to be above both the world and the regional average for at least a dec decade even if in between it declines. So you can, let's say, um, be considered above regional and world average for 12 years, have a dip for a few years, and then go back to being above the world and regional average. And you're still considered to have a long duration because you've met that criteria at some point after your initial transition to democracy. 
The second dimension is what we call trajectory. And this is really looking at the overall trend in a country's level of democracy since its transition, since the, its initial transition, if you will, to democracy. Um, and what this tries to get at is improvement over the long term, really thinking about the arc of democracy. Um, so rather than a year by year score, um, looking at oh, for the entire period for which this country or since this country transitioned to a democracy, um, how, how many has it improved for majority of years or minority of years? Um, and it's based on its own starting point. So whereas the duration, um, the indicators we're using for, for uh, the first dimension is comparing the country's level of democracy to either the regional, to both the regional average and the world average, excuse me. This is comparing the, the country to itself, its own starting point. Has it consistently improved or maintained the level of democracy over time uh, since its transition? So again, there, there are two, two aspects. A, a trajectory can be upward or downward. It's considered upward if the level of democracy trends above the starting point for that country, the initial starting point. The, a majority of the years have to be either same or above uh, the, the starting point. And it's considered downward if the level of democracy trends below the starting point. Again, majority of years since transition have to be below. This, of course, begs the question, um, how do we measure the level of democracy? How do we think about um, that, that indicator? And, you know, of course, there are, there are lots of, of really good measures uh, for uh, democracy, a level of democracy. Um, but we um, decided to use the varieties of democracy, electoral de Demo democracy index, so VDEM, EDI scores, um, because we like the fact that they focus on the role of elections as the core feature of democracy. Um, and so that it includes aspects of the political system that increase the likelihood that elections will result in democratic outcomes. Um, alongside whether the chief executive is elected, it includes separate measures for the degree to which elections are free and fair, freedom of expression, associational autonomy, and inclusive citizenship. So whether or not the electorate itself is expansive in terms of right to vote. Um, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice um, measure um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, first, it, it does a great job at operationalizing uh, Robert Dahl's, the political science, uh, very famous political scientist, uh, Robert Dahl's concept of polyarchy. Um, by aggregating these sort of indicators of what the core institutional guarantees are of democracy. For him, the two dimensions were contestation and participation, right? Focusing on this role, the role of you know, electing um, uh, your officials. So we like that aspect of it. Um, we thought that was more sort of globally comparative and appropriate. Um, we also thought that it was more globally uh, appropriate and comparative and applicable to parts of the, the Muslim majority world um, because it avoids defining democracy in terms of Western cultural values um, while also not being minimalistic, not sort of being Schumpeterian for those of you who are familiar with that uh, literature. Um, so based on these two dimensions, we do what if many of you who know me, <laughs> I like to do, which is we build uh, a typology. And we come up with four ideal types, if you will, or modes of democratic survival. Um, the first uh, we call striving. This is where you have a short duration, but an upward trajectory. Here, you might think of it as the institutional guarantees that um, build and sustain democracies, particularly around this idea of elections as the, the central component of a democracy, free and fair elections, contested elections, widely participatory elections. Um, that these are um, not enduring, so they haven't been able to sustain them for a decade or more, but they are improving. So there's still this notion of they're struggling to maintain these, these, these elements of what we call a democracy. Um, then there's the, uh, the thriving category uh, or ideal type. Um, this is sort of your best case scenario. Um, this is where um, I would argue you, you, you want to be. You have a long duration and an upward trajectory. So your institutional guarantees are both enduring and they're either stabilizing or improving over time. Where you don't wanna be is probably in the waning and backsliding categories, um, but particularly in the waning category. In the waning category, you neither have duration nor trajectory. So you have a short duration, you have a downward trajectory, your institutional guarantees are not enduring um, or improving. So it's, it, it almost feels like you're giving up 
um, democracy is just, it, it's not, it's not, it's not taking hold. And this is where you might see a transition away from democracy. Then you have, I think, a category that's become um, used uh, uh, quite um, prolifically uh, of late, but without really a concrete definition, this category of backsliding. We talk about backsliding all the time. We apply it to a variety of different countries without really being, I think, systematic about what we mean by it. Um, what we mean by backsliding is a long duration. So institutional guarantees are enduring, um, but a downward trajectory. Um, these institutional guarantees are not just not improving, but they, they appear to be in decline. Um, and this is, uh, this is worrisome, but it's not quite as alarming as the waning category because you still have this endurance um, to, to uh, if you will, to, to lean on. Empirically, we see um, cases, we, we investigated um, four, or excuse me, eight uh, Muslim majority countries uh, in our very kind of brief overview uh, in a newsletter that I mentioned earlier. And, and you know, th thought about very systematically where they would fit uh, using our indicators, of course, uh, in these different categories or, or modes, ideal types, however you want to refer to them. And we found, um, I think quite surprisingly, uh, that for, for again, for, for those that are not used to talking about democratic survival in the Muslim world, um, that most of our countries, most of the Muslim majority countries we looked at, fell into the categories of striving or thriving. Uh, the majority, of course, are in the striving category. Um, there, there are four, Albania, Malaysia, Mali, and Tunisia, cross-regional, again, from very diverse, uh, very different uh, parts of the world, um, but with uh, many commonalities. So. Albania and Mali both transitioned to democracy in 1991. Uh, and since then, this is why they're in the short duration uh, category. Um, since then, neither of them have been able to uh, uh, realize an EDI score above both regional and world levels. They've been some, maybe above the region, maybe above the world, but not above both regional and world levels for a decade or more. Um, however, during this time, their levels of democracy uh, in comparison to their starting point have continued to improve. Albania's EDI score uh, has either increased or stayed the same for 16 out of the past 28 years, that is from 1992 to 2019, and Mali's EDI score has an either increased or stayed the same for 19 out of the past 28 years, from between 1992 and 2019. Malaysia and Tunisia transitioned to democracy roughly two decades later than Albania and Mali, but have experienced uh, or exhibited similar tendencies. Malaysia experienced its first competitive election in 2008, and its EDI score has since remained below both the regional and world averages. So it's, that's again why it's in the short duration category. Like Albania and Mali, however, its EDI score has continued to improve. Um, it has increased or stayed the same for eight out of the past 11 years. So it's on an upward trajectory. Tunisia transitioned to democracy as part of the Arab Spring in 2010 and has been consistently above both the regional and world averages since 2012. Tunisia has a, also had an upward trajectory. Its EDI score has either increased or stayed the same for five out of the past nine years between 2011 and 2019. What's interesting about Tunisia is it also shows that this is a sort of dynamic typology sort of the dynamism of this democratic survival and that Tunisia easily, if it does well in the next year or two, if it continues to, um, to uh, endure, um, it will um, meet the threshold for uh, long duration. And it could move into, if it continues on its upward trajectory, it can move into the thriving category. So that's, that's something that's, that's interesting to watch. Speaking of the thriving category, uh, the two Muslim majority countries that we placed in that category are, again, from very different regions, very different parts of the world with very different historical experiences, Indonesia and Senegal. Um, both have a long duration. Indonesia transitioned to democracy in 1998. Its country's EDI score, um, its EDI score has been above, um, consistently above both the regional and world average since 2000. Senegal's EDI score has been above both the regional and world average for even longer, since 1978, for 43 years. Senegal's EDI score has been about both the regional and the world average. Both Indonesia and Senegal also have an upward trajectory. Indonesia's EDI score has either increased or stayed the same for 11 out of the past 21 years. And again, it's beaten by Senegal, uh, who uh, 
uh, it's um, Senegal's EDI score has either increased or stayed the same for 28 out of the past 43 years. The smallest number of countries uh, in our sample fall into these waning and backsliding categories. So Kyrgyzstan and Turkey, uh, respectively. Um, like Mali and uh, Albania, Kyrgyzstan transitioned to democracy in 1991, and its duration has been short, although its level of democracy has consistently been above the regional average since 1992. It's in a pretty weak, average, weak region when it comes to democracy. Um, it has never been above the world average since its transition. Uh, however, like Albania and Mali, Kyrgyzstan's trajectory, or unlike, rather unlike Albania and Mali, Kyrgyzstan's trajectory has been downward. Its EDI score has decreased in the 15 out of the past 28 years between 1992 and 2019. Turkey shares with Kyrgyzstan this downward trajectory uh, since its transition to uh, democracy in 1983. Its, its score has decreased in 19 out of the past 36 years. Um, however, it differs from Kyrgyzstan in this important way that it has a long duration. Turkey's EDI score was consistently above both the regional and the world averages for almost two decades, from 1984 to 2013, before it began to fall below both the regional and the world averages in 2014. And part of that's an artifact of what happened in the region with the Arab Spring and its neighboring uh, Tunisia. Um, so just returning to this idea of you know, some key lessons, um, what, um, what does this say beyond the Muslim world? Um, again, I think it points to democracy as an ongoing struggle to survive. I mean, this typology certainly provide, uh, I guess, uh, applies to democracies around the world. I haven't done the work yet of trying to place democracies outside the Muslim world into this typology, but I'm sure that um, people in the audience can conjure up um, uh, examples that they think might go into one of these other boxes. But I think it's, it's the reconceptualization, sort of trying to get ourselves to think not about democracy as an either or, or as meeting some threshold, um, but rather as a sort of ongoing struggle for survival, to think about democracy and the democratic experience, experience as having an overall arc over time, um, and to think about it as um, varying in degrees of vitality, as opposed to focusing on the mortality of democracy, which I think we've been doing in recent years. Um, it also, I think, allows us to have some degree, at least allows me, uh, that I'd like to part in, in part with you, some degree of, of cautious optimism. Um, if we shift the focus away from the triumph of democracy, you know, it's become the only game in town, um, in the short term to this idea that it's this constant struggle to write the course of democracy over the long term, then um, we don't have to be as discouraged every time we um, we witness something that, that, that makes us think that democracy is in trouble or democracy is under threat. It's always under threat. It's just a matter of what the degree of the threat is and how strong institutions are to meet that threat. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Thanks, Rob. Okay, um, I'll open the, there's, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A. We have a couple that have come in um, already. Uh, I, so I think these came in um, mostly focused on Ameri uh, the United States, but I, um, is there any hope for a third party in the US? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, I think our institutions are rigged against uh, uh, maintaining a third party. We, I think political scientists know that. Um, I think it's uh, unlikely to have a sustainable three party systems, for instance. Um, it just, uh, uh, the way we elect people, the way we vote, the way we populate our, rep our representative institutions makes that very, um, very unlikely that we will have a third party. Now, could we have one, a party that replaces one of the existing parties? Uh, that's happened multiple times in American history, although none since uh, the Civil War, but um, uh, that's certainly possible. But I, I think the U.S. seems likely to maintain itself as a two-party system for a long, for, for uh, as long as these current electoral institutions survive. I don't know if my colleagues want to answer uh, any, any differently. To add to that, that, um, yeah, so if you look around the sets of democracies in the world that have our kind of electoral system, um, they, uh, they and us, uh, there's a strong tendency towards two parties known as uh, Duverger's law when you, you have a winner-take-all electoral system. Uh, 
Um, but as Ken, uh, with uh, uh, another co-author at Michigan at the time, Pradeep Chibber, uh, would emphasize that um, that also relies, that says that there's two parties in every election contest. It doesn't say that it's the same two parties in every district and in every state across all the country. So if we look at other democracies that have our electoral system, uh, some do have more than uh, uh, two parties. They tend to be regional, uh, these other parties. Um, and so another uh, sustainable third party context, in addition to, there are only two, or uh, a third party arises and replaces one of the two, Another possibility is that there's some kind of national coalition uh, and uh, of local regional parties, something like what we see in Canada and even more pronounced uh, what we see in Australia, that there are three main parties, two of which uh, consistently uh, uh, are in alliance with each other. Uh, so something like that could happen, but really the, in the sense, I think the quest question is intended uh, could there be another nationally, uh, another option for American voters? Not unless we change our electoral system and there's no way we're ever gonna change our electoral system. Uh, so no, no prospects. Pauline, do you wanna say anything? I think Rob put it very well. <laughs> <laughs> it if you have time, could you please explain what technocratic leftism mean? I use that term. So I think of the I think of the left in American politics um, and in much of the Western European context as really having three strands. Uh, you have the old kind of 19th and early 20th century um, union-based, labor-based leftism. Uh, socialist uh, could be Marxist in some form, or could be the more modern variant in the U.S. is a kind of robust support for unionizing, uh, maybe even corporate-based unionizing. Um, that's one strand. Another strand is um, uh, a kind of identity-based leftism or um, what Ron Englehart would call post-materialism uh, mixed together, uh, which um, could, uh, is focused on rights and discrimination and uh, equality of opportunity and, and even outcome. Uh, and uh, perhaps elements of uh, environmentalism and um, focus on uh, aspects, the, the spillover effects of, of, um, of, of capitalism on, on, on our well-being in other ways. The third, which is, these are not nice tidy categories, is I think a more, um, I would think of it as like an Obama, Blair, Bill Clinton kind of leftism, which is um, kind of a faith in uh, a faith in government action to fix um, capitalism, relying on markets, but um, robust involvement of the government in the functioning of financial markets and in um, uh, you know trade, etc. Um, they tend to be again trust generally in favor of the forces of the market, but also fixing at the edges using government sources. So those three strands, I think of the latter as technocratic capitalism. And I think with a robust shift of educated people who used to vote for more conservative parties who are now voting for leftist parties tend to be more in the last category. Um, the, the, the middle category perhaps um, but that's 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 where they're shifting. They're 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 voting for people like Clinton, Obama, Blair, etc. So uh, this is a question for Rob. Uh, yeah, I'll oh. take it. Yeah. So the uh, question asks, what inhibits us from changing our electoral college system? So when Ken and I were talking about the electoral system, we weren't exactly speaking about the electoral college, although some of the points apply there too. Um, we, what we meant was that uh, one way you can conduct elections is that there's some number of candidates and, uh, or parties and whoever gets the most votes wins uh, that one seat that's up for election. That's the way we run our elections in the US, that's the way they're run in the UK and in Canada and sort of how they're run in Australia. 
Uh, another way uh, that's similar is called majority system, and that's uh, we know those in mayoral elections in the U.S. For example, many of those are are runoff elections. That uh, if nobody gets an absolute majority, more than fifty percent of the vote, uh, then only the top two remain, and then a majority emerges. Either of those systems creates a strong tendency for parties and voters to coalesce around. Uh, a small number of very large parties, because those are the only ones that will have a chance to win. So there's this strong tendency of our electoral systems to produce two parties. Um, the Electoral College magnifies that, because the Electoral College, which is a, a horrible anachronism, sorry for uh, injecting that, um, is uh, adds to that uh, what's called malapportionment, that not that each person's vote counts differently depending on what state you live in. And that, ju that just amplifies those tendencies. Well, and now and your question is- all. Winner, And also winner take all inside. Right, the winner take all of an even larger number of seats in each contest is, uh, is just magnifies those tendencies greatly. That's in the weeds. The key feature for why can't we change that is, well, the folks with the power to change those systems would be the lawmakers uh, who were elected by that existing system. So just as you see that um, there's no way in the world uh, currently the Republican Party would ever agree to, ch to allow uh, the Electoral College to change because they would never win another presidential election, uh, the, the, uh, the, then the, um, uh, you know, so they're not gonna allow it and it won't change. And it, that's very, very general. So that uh, the folks who are in power to change the electoral system will have been elected by that electoral system and so they won't allow the change. So there's a question. Uh, are, are Ken's findings on individual level party movements compatible with Rob's findings about the perceptions of economic threat? Rob, what do you think about that? Uh, so the first thing I would underscore if I understood Ken's data right is that Ken's data is about individuals' perceptions of the two parties. So uh, the average, you know, Joe on the street responding, uh, Joe and Jill on the street, oh, not, not Joe and Jill. I got to use different names. Those are now the president. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, the average respondent is saying, oh, well, I'm uh, a Republican, say. Uh, and so we're obviously not extremists, so we're at five. Uh, and and uh, and those uh, uh, those Democrats have clearly gone uh, social communist, uh, and so they're they're at one or zero, uh, and so the perceptions have very clearly diverged, very greatly and moderately symmetrically uh, that it, uh, about how the the voters of the different kinds see each other. Um, if you look at the party's positions and their candidates and what, uh, what's in their platforms um, and how they vote as representatives, it's decidedly not symmetric. Uh, that the Democrats are still a party of uh, center left, maybe have drifted a little bit further leftward uh, and the Republicans have, have moved dramatically uh, rightward in the last 20 years. Um, now, how does that resonate? Uh, I don't think I see a contradiction um, I mean, the things that I'm talking about are the um, are the inputs in Ken's system that there are uh, there are policies that the parties are taking and there are outcomes that are occurring in the world that are shaping people's vote choices uh, and their partisanship. Uh, so my expectation trying to build Ken's uh, and John's arguments into my own, uh, my group's own, uh, I would say is that I none of what we're talking about will have had much chance to shift partisanship yet. That people are st still, you know, there, there's a lot of inertia in that partisanship. But a lot of what we're talking about, you see in the vote change that Ken's talking about when he talks about um, suburban educated, now strongly, increasingly strongly democratic voters uh, and a rural less educated uh, and uh, overwhelmingly white uh, in, uh, voting, uh, work, working class voting in, increasingly for, uh, uh, for uh, well, tr first Trump and, and now the, the Trump is done by the Republican Party. 
So this is a question for Pauline. Do you see any evidence of a resource curse undermining democracy within a set of Muslim countries that you've analyzed? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I see a, uh, the inverse of the resource curse. So the resource curse is usually talked about as, as um, being endowed um, with uh, natural resources, makes you less likely to democratize. Here, it's about economic conditions of economic development. Certainly in the case of Kyrgyzstan, what's mostly undermined democracy is similar to what tends to undermine democracy sometimes in very poor countries. Um, corrupt elites, uh, uh, economic underdevelopment, uh, increasing poverty, um, as well as polarization. You know, something that we're facing in our own country that, that people see as a threat, potential threat to, to democracy. Um, so not a resource curse in the traditional way that it's thought of, uh, but a, a maybe a lack of resources for sure. Okay. Uh, I think that exhausts the questions and I think we're just about uh, finished in our time. I wanna thank Rob and Pauline. This was great. Um, we came at well, it from different you, directions Ken. and it was, uh, um, I wanna thank our audience and uh, for your patience and um, we hope to be in person next year with uh, an event with uh, um, uh, returning back to, 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 to be able to gather in a, in a location um, in one room. So. Thank you uh, again uh, to the speakers and um, uh, thanks to Catherine Pearson who helped put this together. Mm -hmm. And I wish everybody um, uh, good health, good luck, uh, and um, you know, uh, have, a, have a good rest of your evening. So thanks.